Hello there, and welcome to the Believer's Church Podcast. A podcast about real people, real problems, and real answers. Podcasting from the beautiful East Tennessee Mountains. Here's your host, Pastor Mike Friday. The topic right now is... Can a follower of Christ lose their salvation? We're in a series called Questions All Summer Long. Questions that many people think about a lot, maybe don't ask. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 4 through 6. Seems to be the stumbling block for so many people when it comes to this issue of can a follower of Christ lose their salvation? And beginning in verse 4, we might see probably the biggest warning in the New Testament, definitely in the book of Hebrews itself. In Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, it says, For it is impossible, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up in contempt. So we have two questions here that I think would be appropriate for us to answer. The first one is this, who are these people that's being described in this text and what is their spiritual condition? Now over the years, I've come to gather that there are three views which have been taken Uh, on on this issue. Number one, the first view would be this, that these people were genuine Christians, began as sincere followers of Jesus Christ, but they fell away and lost their salvation. Now, this is one of the key passages in the New Testament implied by those who teach the idea that it is possible for someone who has been genuinely converted to lose their salvation. But a problem for them is the writer says that in losing it, it is impossible for them to get it back. So the problem for them is that they teach that if you lose your salvation, you can reclaim it again. That's not what this text says. But we should ask, what does the scripture teach us about this thought? Those who are genuinely saved, will they ever be lost? Now in John chapter 10, in verse 28 and 29, verse 28 and 29, we find this. I give them eternal life, Jesus speaking, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And someone say, well, what about run out of his hand or something like that? I'm like, nope, that's not going to happen. Our God is too strong. We're not strong enough to get out of the hands of God. Jesus also addresses this fact within... In, in, he's, in Matthew 24, he's talking about the, grace of, the, the days of just great difficulty that points to the signs at the end of the age in Matthew 24 and verses 10 through 13. He says, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Uh, So there are going to be many false prophecies that appear and deceive many people's hearts and grow cold, but he who stands firm to him will be saved. Now, many many understood the idea of being a follower of Christ, but not truly accepted by faith. Thus, the idea of number one would make the Bible contradict itself, which it does not do. Now, number two, the second idea is this, would be that this is a description of, again, of genuine Christians who are being confronted by a hypothetical warning. And the idea is if they were to ever do this, then this would be the case, but they're never going to do that. In other words, this is only a hypothetical warning, not really a realistic warning. And the third view, the one which I believe is true and a correct look at the scriptures, suggests that the description here of individuals who have been influenced by the gospel, who have shown outward signs of being Christians, but who in fact are not Christians. Now, as we just read that, you're probably going, I don't know how you can see anything other than just that original article there. Can I just give you one name? Judas Iscariot. He's an example of a classic to all who profess faith of how close it it is possible to be to action without actually being included in the family of faith. So these warnings are here. They're not fictional warnings, but the description here is of individuals as in 1 John 2, 19, who have gone out from the family of faith because they never really belonged to it in the first place. Now, the warnings here given in Hebrews are not given to cause us despair, 
like to cause us to worry and, and to and that would cause unwarranted struggles in our in our lives. That's that's why the writer goes on in verse nine really quick to some encouragement. But this warning is here to cause caution in the complacent and to cause the professing believer to take stock of where they are at. Where are you at today in your walk with Christ? For instance, are you stuck in infancy in chapter five? The writer in Hebrews says they have no apparent interest in spiritual maturity then I would say you need to pay close attention to what the writer conveys in this passage because it has something to say to those who want a Christian reality without the reality of a Christian walk. It's all about grace and nothing about the holiness of God. But all through the Bible, it clearly affirms that all who are drawn to Christ, who come to faith in Him, who are eternally delivered from sin and condemnation, will not live in moral carelessness. And this is a very, very important point. And the idea that being brought to genuine faith in Jesus Christ and being made aware of my sin being delivered from condemnation, that somehow or another this is some eternal insurance policy, I believe, if we're not careful, can lead us down the road to moral carelessness that cannot be taught from the Bible. When a man or woman is born again of the Spirit of God, they will give evidence of it, in part by desiring to live a holy life. And we hear and see those who have no interest in the gospel, never attend church or share their faith, no interest in worship. But after all, they would say it's a good thing we believe in eternal security. And I would say, well, what eternal security would you be believing in? Certainly not the description we find in the New Testament. So the writer in accord with the other New Testament writers, does not provide a doctrine as to suggest that our faith and our persistence are not in alignment. We're kept by God's power, according to 1 Peter 1, 5, through faith, and those words are two key words. In other words, our persistence, our willingness to move forward and to become more like Jesus Christ, holiness, is in alignment with our faith, what we say we believe. There is no persistence without faith, and Where there is faith, you will find persistence, of course. It's not that we retain our salvation on the basis of persistence, but it is that we give evidence of our salvation by our continuance, our willingness, by holding steady to the end. Right? So these are not easy verses that we come to, and you may be wavering as you listen to this and and ready to move on to the next message, but I would urge you to hang in here for just a few more minutes. So keep in mind that these individuals here described in Hebrews are not just drifting away like willy-nilly. Rather, they are deliberate. It's public, and it's something that's continuous. They are willfully and totally renouncing Christ, and they're taking place along those who call themselves the enemy of Christ. They are individuals who have heard the good news, but just like Herod, King Herod in the New Testament, I mean, he, he loved to hear John the Baptist preach, we see from the Scriptures. It made him do many good things, whatever that means. Maybe it stirred him to some kind of action, but in the long haul, he delivered John the Baptist's head up on a plate. And these individuals described here may have convinced themselves and truly persuaded others that they truly belonged to Christ, but in time, their profession proved empty. They professed Christ, but they were not possessed by Christ. Why do I believe this is the case? Let's look at some of the statements that they made there. Look back in Hebrews chapter 6 and those verses that we read. I would say number one, we see there it says, they have been enlightened. They have been enlightened. What does this mean to be exposed to the light? I mean, if you're in darkness and the light comes on, you're exposed to the light. So they have experienced, they have been informed. They've encountered the principles of Christianity. So they have preferred Christianity over their other options, which was Judaism and paganism. And when someone would ask them to say, oh, we're a Christian, we're not a pagan, we're not one in the Judaism. So their perception of the truth is perhaps intellectual. Maybe certain facts have appealed to them. Now, this is no different than folks who sit in churches all across America today. They have determined to put themselves in the position of Christian influence and perhaps even Christian profession but they are on the outside looking in like these individuals. Something else we see here, the second thing, they have tasted the heavenly gift. You see that in the scripture there. Heavenly here means the gospel. So you might think that to taste the heavenly gift would mean that you are a Christian. But let me ask you this. Have you ever tasted fried chicken livers? How much of it did you taste? How much of it did you have? One bite? Did you eat it all? 
just enough to know what it's like, but never really enjoyed a full piece and went and ordered a hamburger at McDonald's. You're like, one, one bite's enough for me. Now I'm on my journey. I'm going on my way to what I know is good. Of course, we've all tasted something like that. We've all tried different kinds of things without knowing the blessing and benefit of what it brings. But was it life-changing? Was it a life-changing taste with a desire to live the life of God? But it is entirely possible to have a taste of something without benefiting from its personal experience. So these people had tasted something of the meaning of following Christ, like the second sower that we see in the Gospels. And the second sower, the, the seed falls on rock, and they receive it, the Bible says, with great joy. But in time of testing, they fell away. They had a taste, but not a life-changing taste. So there are a lot of people out there who are spiritual tasters, I mean, one Sunday they're here, another Sunday they're there, but there's no change in their lives. They may have received the word, but they're not rooted. There's no steady growth. Something else we see in this passage, number three, is they shared in the Holy Spirit. You say, well, surely some couldn't have shared in the Holy Spirit and not be a genuine believer. Well, I believe they had known the influence of the Holy Spirit. They had sat and heard the word of God and had been convicted of their sin. No one comes to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. The Holy Spirit draws us. But they would shake it off. They'd get on down the aisle with their life, and they're gone. And you know, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. In other words, not everyone who's got the language down and knows the right words, just because they say certain things, don't be fooled. Many will say on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And it sounds like a Christian to me. And Jesus will say, I never knew you evil doers. The fourth thing we see there is this. They tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. I think this means that they had found that God is faithful to his word. You say, well, why is this? Because they had resolutely turned their backs to the very truths which would be the means of bringing them to repentance. So what does God use to bring people to repentance? Well, the enlightenment of His Word, convicting influences of the Holy Spirit, the power of His Word. And here are individuals who say, yeah, I heard all that. I used to do that. I was in the Bible study, even taught a Bible class, attended church, was baptized there. But don't you give me the gospel anymore because I have no interest in it. I'm going on my way. I'm going to do my thing. So what do we learn in this scripture? I think we have a description of individuals who at one time professed a knowledge of the gospel. In their head, they had it. Experienced something of his influence. Maybe were identified by choice with Christ, but who have now abandoned openly and totally the profession of Christian faith. Now listen, he's not describing, the author is not describing the occasional falling into sin without any remorse, without any repentance of sin. For those of us who are in Christ who struggle with that from time to time, that's not the teaching here. So then this would mean that individuals who return to sin with enthusiasm, who renounce their Christian profession, who display a total absence of remorse in doing so, and who continue in that way to the end of their lives, we are clearly despite Initial experiences are never truly born again. So why does it say that it is impossible for them to return? Listen, because they have trampled the very way provided by God to repentance. They've trampled the gospel. They've turned their backs on it, and they don't believe it, and they're going the opposite direction. So if you are convicted by the Spirit of God, He shows you your sin and brings you to an end of yourself and points you to the atoning death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. The day, today is the day of salvation. Do you feel the Holy Spirit urging you, pray, ask Christ to forgive you of your sin and live your life for Him and put your faith and put your hope in Him today? So the answer, can a true follower of Christ lose their salvation? No. Let me say that again. And a key word here is the word true. Can a true follower of Christ lose their salvation? I believe the answer to that is no. 
Thanks for listening to the Believer's Church Podcast. Visit us online at www.believerschurch.tv Facebook.com slash believerschurch.tv Follow Pastor Mike at twitter.com slash Mike Friday and instagram.com slash MF Real Life. Check out the other podcasts all about life and the Word. Until next time, keep it real and come on.